Um, and so our next presentation is going to be Nashir Contractor, who is reporting live from Mars with the Curiosity rover as uh, his virtual teammate. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And thank you also for uh, Lauren for framing this beautifully. I've seen every time I see you do this presentation, I learn something new about all the cool stuff that you and your colleagues are doing at BHP. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Okay. Are you seeing it? We are. Great. Okay. So uh, the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is um, work that uh, has basically been done, I would say, uh, by Brennan, who's a PhD student here at Northwestern in Industrial Engineering and Management Science, um, with a little bit of guidance from Leslie uh, Suzanne Bell, who um, is a collaborator on this project, um, was affiliated with DePaul when we started this project, but is actually now one of Lauren's colleagues at NASA. So, uh, uh, so this is a project where one of the things that I must say I enjoy taking credit for, perhaps my fundamental and most important contribution to projects is coming up with uh, catchy acronyms and titles and things of that kind. And um, this project from which this comes is called uh, uh, CRUISE, which stands for Crew Recommender for Effective Work in Space. And I shall take full credit for coming up with that acronym. And then my second credit that I will take is coming up for the title of this talk. As you will see, um, it's a play on words. It's talking about repairing teams for long, long duration space exploration. Okay. <clears throat> um, I have a, a lot of slides that I'm going to uh, go through very quickly. Uh, the bottom line I want to talk about today is how do we put together the right team to go into space? And that's sort of where most of our work on this particular project has gone. It comes sometimes in the IO psych world. Uh, it's inspired by what is called a screw composition. And so uh, what, what I want to talk about here is what is happening in terms of crew selection. If you think about it, crew selection started a long time ago where first when people were interested in going on scary missions to places like Antarctica, um, they, uh, Ernest Shackleton uh, put this ad out in the, in, the, in the classified saying men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful honor and recognition in the event of success. So you can see that there have been uh, scary ways of trying to recruit people to go on these long expeditions at the time. Um, subsequently, when you came to crew selection, we all uh, must have read or heard about the Mercury 7, the first set of astronauts that were uh, selected, the all-male se uh, selection at the time. And also a lot of this was immortalized by Tom Wolfe in the book, The Right Stuff, which looked at what are the kinds of qualities that were required for people in this area. Uh, today, we're talking about a very different environment where people are thinking, as Lauren mentioned and framed it, about how to create a select crews that are going to go on really longer missions, unlike the Mercury 7 or even until relatively recently, uh, the missions that were either in terms of Apollo or the space shuttle missions, et cetera. And uh, the International Space Station, which is where this picture is taken from, shows that all of a sudden now, or important qualities involved in, uh, in these missions are not people who might just be, who may be pretty in terms of what was required in the right stuff, uh, or even some of the crazy uh, individuals who decided to go to the Antarctic, but people who are brilliant at knowing the perfect balance of fun with professionalism. This is one of the diary entries that was written by an ISS astronaut uh, talking about uh, their commander at the time. So part of what we've been doing as part of this project, and Alina uh, Lungianu, who is also our colleague here at Northwestern, has been very involved in this, is to try to see if we can develop a computer model that would allow us to predict what will happen to a team when they are put into a mission over a long duration of time. And so think of this as essentially a version of SimCity or a simulation game where we know some things about these individuals before they get on, get into the mission. And we're gonna do our best to see if we can use a computer simulation to predict what will happen to their relationships over the course of the mission. 
And we've been doing this in the context of NASA's HERA facility that Lauren showed us, which is the Human Exploration Research Analog Facility at the Johnson Space Center. We've also now begun collecting data from 120-day mission, um, actually completed collecting data from 120-day mission uh, in the Mars 500, which was in Moscow, which was, and then we are also gearing up for another one, uh, which is a much longer mission also at uh, Mars 500. So the basic idea is that we build a conceptual model of all the factors that we think theoretically and otherwise uh, might impact the ways in which individuals would uh, relate to one another. Uh, we then go ahead and uh, collect data, observing all those factors, including relationships uh, in the context of a human exploration research analog on Mars, that's step two. Then step three is we build a computer model where we estimate the relative importance of the various predictors of uh, crew relationships. Step four is we see how well do, is our model doing, how good a fit it is. And then step five, which is where I'm gonna focus our attention today, is once we have a model, how can we use this model to anticipate what might go wrong with the crew and see how we can repair that relationship. So in terms of the first step, uh, we built a model over the last three and a half, four years now, where we look at a variety of different uh, sets of variables or buckets of variables that impact the extent to which crew members, social relationships are being impacted. Some of them are based on personality variables associated with the individuals. The second on the bottom right is the personality fit, the kinds of variables, uh, the kind of compatibility between people's personality that might affect it. The, the third year is social network trends, that is the extent to which prior network ties are going to impact future network ties. The, the oops, sorry, the, this section here, the tasks and scheduling is a set of, uh, to what extent are the relationships gonna be impacted by the amount of workload by ha they have, the kinds of tasks, the interdependence of these tasks, the duration of these tasks, et cetera. As Lauren mentioned in response to Ellie's question, these individuals are choreographed every minute of the day. So we know exactly what they're doing. That's called a playbook. And so we have very detailed maps of exactly what tasks they were doing when and with whom if it was a task that was not a solo task. And then finally, in these crews, uh, there were times where they had communication delay between the crew and the so-called mission control. So this was to simulate time lag that will happen in actually space missions. They were put into sleep deprivation where there were periods of time where they couldn't sleep for extended periods of time. And then of course, the effects of cumulative workload uh, that were, will continue to build on them, et cetera. So given that all of these were used to model crew relations, and then we also model, model the extent to which those crew relations impact performance. So with this conceptual model, then we began to collect data. So this is task two, where we were observing data. So this is actual data that we collected from one of the missions. So this was four crew members in, in HERA, and we asked them a question, with whom do you work effectively? And these are the green arrows, and you see over time, we collected this data periodically over the course of the mission. And as you can see, in general, the folks seem to enjoy working with each other quite effectively. There are plenty of green arrows going in both directions very often, et cetera. The interesting thing is to look at this one at the bottom, the hindrance. We also ask them who makes tasks difficult to complete. And now all of a sudden you see, as you look at this, something quite peculiar, that this one person um, is clearly being hated on by everyone else, or at least seen as a hindrance by everyone else, and doesn't seem to necessarily reciprocate that. So the question for us was, to what extent could we have predicted that this one person would turn into a hindrance for this model? And to what extent could we have done something to avoid that situation from happening? There are two ways in which you can avoid it and say this person shouldn't go on the crew. Or if we say, no, this person has to go on the crew because of a variety of reasons this person is the most qualified to, then what could we do to help make sure that we minimize the extent to which this person is seen as a hindrance? So this is the kind of data that we collected. This is the facility uh, where they would go into it and they would stay there for uh, 30 days or 45 days, depending on which campaign we collected data from. We collected campaign from, in this case, we're reporting data that we collected from, four, uh, from 12 of these four member crews. And, uh, and for each of them, we collected data from between eight and to 12 time points. So we would get longitudinal data over the course of the 30 or 45 day mission. We then built a computational model that allowed us to actually estimate the extent to which these people's ties would be positive or negative and how it might change over a period of time. Um, 
We used a, a platform called NetLogo, which I'm pleased to say was developed right here at Northwestern by our colleagues Uri Wolensky in the School of um, Education and Social Policy, as well as in Computer Science. Uh, one of the interesting things you see here is the roles of these people, and that is the commander, the mission specialist one, the mission specialist two, and the flight engineer. I mentioned this because we'll come back to it again uh, later on. So when we do this and we look at the, and we start estimating how much effect do each of these parameters that we had impact the extent to which it is. So this is the estimation phase here. And what we find in this is that in fact, many of these are interesting predictors. So the extent to which a, a member, a crew members who tend to enjoy working with individuals who are also high in self-monitoring. So the extent to which you're good at self-monitoring means that you're somebody who also other people enjoy working with and individuals are less likely to be viewed as making tasks difficult to complete. So clearly self-monitoring is an individual characteristic of a person that helps predict who you or that people enjoy working with you and don't find you as much of a hindrance. Uh, we see also, for example, that higher workload makes crew members less likely to enjoy working with others. This is not necessarily a surprise, but it's always good to get affirmation of some predictors that you expect might have an effect, et cetera. Uh, and then taking all of these different results, we then wanted to see how good does this model do. It's one thing to say that a model is um, would be able to get some estimates, but we want to see the goodness of fit. We want to see the extent to which this is explaining a certain amount of variance, if you may. And to do that, we used uh, essentially a set of uh, measures that is pretty standard today in machine learning models. And these would be things like accuracy, uh, precision, and recall. And as you can see more generally, that if you looked at in terms of task affect, uh, we do a pretty good job of being accurate. And we do our F scores, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall is also relatively high. We don't do as well when it comes to predicting who makes tasks difficult to complete. Um, and part of the reason we noticed the F1 score, which is in some ways the best measure, it's only 0.566 as compared to 0.846. Part of the reason for this is that we just don't have enough data on people who don't like each other. The good news for the mission is that not many people report saying that they find other people a hindrance. When you don't have a lot of data on who is a hindrance, that gives you a very imbalanced data set, makes it more difficult for, from our point of view to make good models to predict that. Um, we did the same thing for other, other measures in terms of leadership networks, et cetera. And then again, for the balance of time, what I want to do here for the next few minutes is say how we applied this to now that we had this model and we tested, we built this model over the course of uh, two and a half years, and we did a pretty good job of it. And so uh, we must say that when we got these results, it was definitely far more than we had expected that we would be able to do it when we began this project. I, to some extent, I would joke with folks that this is not network science. This, this is and not computational social science. This is more network science fiction or computational social science fiction, but we were pr very pleased to see the extent to which we were able to do this. Um, but of course, then NASA challenged us and uh, folks at, uh, folks at uh, uh, like Lauren and her colleagues like Tom Williams said, it's one thing to tell us that you can predict something is going to wrong, but it's another thing to really help us then tell us what we can do when things go wrong. So that can you not only predict it, but can you help fix it, which is the mitigation strategy. And so the one way in which we could help fix it is not fix who would go on the crew, but we could fix who pairs up with whom on working on tasks. So the idea is that if a couple of people don't get along, then we have a choice. Should we tell them not to work with each other for a period of time? Do we have them work only on things they do well? Do we have them work with someone else that they enjoy working with? So these were the strategies that we had. And this is where the focus that we, fo uh, that we had in this particular case was to see what that task schedule is, that playbook that we've already discussed, the exact schedule of who's supposed to work with whom, when, et cetera. And NASA gave us some flexibility to say, you might help us tell us if there are certain people who you think are on the verge of you know, tearing each other apart, are there ways in which we could reschedule who's gonna work with whom and to help repair the situation. And so that's where we come to this uh, pairing and repairing and therefore repairing the team, which is the play of words that started the title of this talk. And so our goal was to see how we could do crew pairing in this particular case and how could we model to repair, anticipate and mitigate problem relationships, et cetera. So what we did was we took uh, data from the mission, from each of the crews. So this is over the last couple of years, we took data from each crew before they got into the mission. We got it, we did interviews with them, got survey data from them. And in that one week from the time when we got that, 
we ran simulations. And when I say we, I really mean Brennan ran simulations that predicted how these crews were going to do over the course of the 45 day mission and gave us results that said, we think that these two pairs of, that this pair is going to have trouble on day 20 or on day 30, et cetera. And then with that data, we said, okay, well, if we know that these two people are not going to do very well, what can we do today in terms of the task scheduling to either see what tasks they may or may not be given in order to help get the results? And one of the challenges you face in something like this is, how do you know that your pairing worked? And so in order to see whether our pairing worked or not, what we did was we, we, gave, we, we assigned two specific tasks that we're going to talk about. But we also came up with a goal to say, how can we maximize the number of days where the crew members live well together and minimize the number of days where the crew members find each other difficult to work with. And so we had two tasks that were fairly interdependent. One was sampling on, uh, on a satellite of Saturn, one of the moons of Saturn, Phobos. And then the other was a rover task where they would go off and do um, uh, things with a, with a, with a rover. With a rover. And uh, both of these were ranked very high. Now, if we had to go to the simulation initially, this is what we would look at. So if depending on the pairings, the commander and the flight engineer, this is why I asked you to remember the names, and the commander and the mission specialist and the commander and mission specialist too. So we see that there are not many, not a lot, but somewhat fluctuations in terms of how well these members liked one another. We also see that there was quite a lot of fluctuation over the crew uh, over time and also between crews about what happened in whether these people didn't like each other. In this particular case, what you see is that the mission, that the density of the network, the other network being who you, do, who you find difficult to work with, was moderate on day one. It peaked by the time you get to day 13. And then the people start getting used to each other, et cetera, and they do well. But then again, towards the end, in the last quarter, they seem to, again, find each other difficult to work with, et cetera. But you see the differences here that in some cases, the command and the mission specialist, if they were asked to work together, that particular pairing worked better than if the command and mission specialist too were asked to work together. So what we did was to make sure that we were testing different configurations for the four missions that we studied, we looked to see, sorry, that for the four missions that we were studying, we, in some cases, we actually put people in the best configuration and in other cases, we put them in the worst configuration. And the reason we wanted to do this is to see whether if our hypothesis was correct, then would they be doing better when we put them in the best configuration as compared to when we put them in the worst configuration. And, in, and so we essentially had them work over the course of the 45 day mission. We assigned who was going to be working with whom. MDO refers to mission day four. So they would take a survey on day five saying what they did uh, what they experienced was working on the rover task on mission day four, the same thing with mission day six, 13, 19, and then they also did the four vast missions that was only towards the second half of the, of the mission, et cetera. So the first thing we wanted to do is after they do a task, we wanted to make sure they remembered at least who they did the task with. So this is, you can think of it as a manipulation check, and we asked them, you did this four vast task yesterday, do you remember who you did it with? And lo and behold, 100% got that right. So they clearly remembered who they did the task with, which is good. And then we began to say, how do you rate the person that you work with? And the push, and the, what we found was that the people who, who rated, who we thought was their best partner, in fact, got rated higher than those who we thought were their worst partner. Now notice this is not a significant difference, but the ordering at least is correct. When we asked them who makes tasks difficult to complete, we saw, a significant difference. In other words, those who we said were the worst partners that we paired on tasks definitely found the other person to be much worse, twice as much worse, if not more, than the people who we thought were the best partner. And this was statistically significant. So just to put it in normal language, when we said to people that we, if we put them on a task together, we think they're going to enjoy working or we think that they're not going to find each other a hindrance, our results basically show that we nailed it in terms of being able to predict who was likely to uh, enjoy working with each other and who was likely not to enjoy working with each other. So we take these results and then again, just to wrap up here, these are again, basically the best condition and the worst condition, the best is in green, the worst is in some version of brown or orange here. And across the missions, you see that in mission two and mission three, when we put people in the best pairings, those were in fact significantly, they did significantly better than, were rated each other significantly more than those who were in the worst pairing. 
in three out of the four missions, mission two, mission three, and, and mission four. I'm sorry, this is moving on its own. Um, and then again, when it came to making life difficult, year again, we were very successful in mission two, mission three, mission four, where when we said you pair these people and they're not gonna get along well, they certainly didn't. And they certainly complained as compared to the other pairings by a significant amount. And again, we can do the same thing with other missions, et cetera. So the bottom line is that again here, we took the challenge that was, that was given to us by NASA and saying it's not enough just to predict who's gonna get along with who, but tell us how we can change the scheduling, repair the scheduling so that in fact, it would repair the team itself. And I'm hoping that some of the results here that I've shown you uh, allowed us to do that. I know that we're running short on time. So I will simply say we repeated the same thing on the, on the second task. Uh, year 97.9% of the responses identified the current partner, but the results were essentially identical. So the takeaway here is that we have come to a point where we are now able to use computational models, not only to predict who gets along with who, but also to be able to uh, engage in reassignment of tasks as a way of minimizing or mitigating some of the problems that we anticipate in these crews. I will stop with that. Thank you.